Good afternoon and welcome to the second webinar of the Watershed Management Webinar Series, a special forest policy e-talks in partnership with the Forest Management Bureau. I am Michiko Buot, your host for today. I hope everyone is connecting fine despite the weather, despite the typhoon. Anyway, if you are experiencing connection issues, we also have Facebook live stream of the webinar that you can join. Okay, so currently we are already, wow, we are already 559 participants here joining in the Zoom room. Well, we don't, we did not expect that given that we are um, expecting a typhoon, but we are very thankful that you are continuing to support us, supporting this um, advocacy to save our watershed, all right? And then we also have 94 participants viewing the Facebook Live, Ayan. So if you have time, please just share the, uh, the post, the Facebook live stream, so many would know what this cause is about, all right? So while waiting for the others to log in, we're waiting for others to share the Facebook Live or to view in our Facebook Live, no? Um, I would like to invite everyone to participate in this little icebreaker, all right? I'm sure that we would like to get to know more of each other. So I have prepared this Menti game for you to answer. Ayan, so next slide na natin. If you have a separate device near you, you may use it to type menti.com or just scan this QR code. All right, tapos ilagay nyo lamang po ang PIN code na ito, 5385296. If you are going to log in at a different device. So mas preferable po yun na mag-log in kayo sa different device. If you have an um, another phone, if you are using Zoom uh, and your laptop might um, maybe you can um, access the Mentimeter via another device, all right? So I'm just going to screen share this. One second, please. Hmm. Ayan, para mayroong nang pong nagsasagot. <laughs> That's good. Ayan. Which part, the first question would be, which part of the globe are you from? And if from the Philippines, just type in your province. Ayan. So, ang dami po nating na taga Laguna. Ayan. Philippines, of course. Ayan. I think most of us talaga po here. Uh, most of the participants here are coming from the Philippines, but we are actually um, um, expecting participants coming from different parts of the globe. Meron po kasing mga nag-register. Ayan, maybe they have not yet, um, they have not yet uh, logged in. Maybe they have just accessed on our Facebook Live, no? Ayan. Okay, so next, next uh, question. We are only going to answer two questions po. Next question is, which word best describes you? Um, so ito po yung mga pamimilian. If you are a student, just, um, just choose student. If you are from the academe or from, the, from a research uh, institution, a non-government organization, government agency, or a private agency or individual. Which are you uh, from this uh, selections, from this choices? I think marami pong um, nag-choose ng government agency. Ayan, 61. All right. So thank you for participating. Ayan, kita na po natin no, yung mga sagot. I'm just going to stop share. <laughs> Ayan, so now that we all know where we are connected from, where we are from, we basically know each other better, no? I hope that sets a good atmosphere for learning, for discussion, and this webinar. So to officially start this webinar, may I invite everyone for, a, for an invocation and the singing of the national anthem. This will be followed by an animation of the house rules. Dear God, Thank you for allowing us today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another in this webinar. 
We are truly grateful for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. May you extend your divine wisdom to our speaker so that he would be able to impart effectively his God-given knowledge to all of us. Bless the participants as well so that they would be able to glean the vital information from this activity and spread what we've learned in the spirit of your love and generosity. May we realize that this activity should glorify your name. Amen. Once again, good afternoon and welcome to the second webinar of the Watershed Management Webinar Series, a special forest policy ETOX in partnership with the Forest Management Bureau, DENR, in support to the Forest Land Management Project Save Our Watershed campaign. Uh, again, so to the uh, 671 participants in the Zoom platform and 123 participants joining the FB Live, here is what you will expect of the webinar today. First, we will be listening to the remarks from the CFNR Dean and the Director of FNB. This will be followed by two paper presentations from, of course, Dr. Cruz and Forrester Castillo. They will be discussing about the key concepts and functions and the current status of watersheds in the Philippines. After this, we will get a chance to ask questions from our resource speakers. The webinar will be closed by a remark from the FDC director, Dr. Dalam. Again, so I hope everyone is ready and excited for this webinar. Also, thank you to all the participants coming from all over the world for your interest. And there are some people asking for the Facebook live stream link. You may just type in and search our um, Facebook page at, our, at your Facebook app. Um, our name is UPLB Forestry Development Center. All right? Ayan, so makikita niyo po kami dyan. And then, to officially start the webinar and deliver the welcome remarks, here is the Dean of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, Dean Marlo D. Mendoza. A rainy but warm greetings to everyone. Special mention to my good friend and a colleague in the forestry sector, Forester Marshall C. Amaro Jr., Assistant Secretary for Policy, Planning, and Foreign Assisted and Special Projects, and Concurrent Director of the Forest Management Bureau. My former professor and one of my esteemed mentors, Dr. Rex Victor O. Cruz, NAST academician and UPLB professor who will discuss watershed features and functions. A former colleague and dedicated watershed management advocate in the FMB, Forrester Alicia 
El Castillo, Chief of the Watershed Ecosystem Management Section, FMB, will present the current status of Philippine watersheds in the Philippines. The energetic and spirited director of the Forestry Development Center, Dr. Priscilla Sidolon, and all the FDC staff, participants from the different organizations represented here today. A pleasant good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the FDC DNR Forest Policy eTalks Watershed Management Webinar Series in support to the Forest Land Management Projects Save Our Watershed Campaign. I would like to congratulate the Forest Land Management Project or FMP of the DNR for partnering with the Forestry Development Center to promote the practice of sustainable watershed management through the conduct of a series of watershed management webinars. This initiative reflects the strong recognition of both the FMP DNR and FDC of the importance of watersheds. We all know that watersheds play key roles in providing ecosystem functions, specifically provisioning, regulating, supporting, and sociocultural functions. Commonly associated goods and services watersheds provide include timber, water for domestic, commercial, and agricultural uses, livelihood for local communities, control occurrence of excessive soil erosion, promote carbon sequestration, ecotourism value, and protecting the country's biodiversity. Recognition of the important role of watersheds to achieve resilience of both natural and social systems has been more pronounced due to impacts of climate change. In addition, protection and rehabilitation of the watersheds contribute to carbon conservation and sequestration, and hence help the country achieve its climate change mitigation goals. During several years of ineffective watershed management, many of the country's watersheds experienced degradation and loss of value, therefore unable to meet the demand for the numerous goods and services needed by a coupled human and natural system. This is against the backdrop of a large and still growing population, land conversion, and extreme weather events. Without effective and immediate interventions to save our watersheds, our quality of life will be adversely affected and continue to deteriorate. This afternoon's webinar will enable us to have a deeper understanding on the key features, functions, and the current status of watersheds in the Philippines. I hope that the paper presentations today will steer us into more concrete and timely action on how we can better manage our watersheds and save those that are already in its critical state. We enjoin everyone to actively participate in this open forum. I, I mean, during the open forum. Thank you very much and good day, everyone. Thank you, Dean. And now may I call on the Assistant Secretary for Policy Planning and Foreign Assistant and Special Projects DENR and Concurrent Director of the FMB, ASEC Marshall C. Amaro, Jr. Thank you, Madam uh, MC. Dean Marlo Mendoza of the UP Los Banos College of Forestry and Natural Resources. 
Director Presi Dulong of the Forestry Development Center. Uh, resource persons, of course, uh, who would be properly introduced later, but who needs uh, no pr uh, proper introduction. Uh, Dr. Rex Victor Cruz and our very own uh, forester Alice Castillo of our watershed uh, ecosystems management section. And uh, over, so far, over 730, 730 uh, who are joining us uh, via Zoom uh, is spread all over the country. A pleasant day to one and all despite tropical storm Julina or Konson. This is the second session of the uh, webinar series uh, being conducted by the Forestry Development Center and the UPLB Foundation Incorporated, entitled Forest Policy E-Tox Watershed Management, based on the partnership with the Forest Management Bureau's Forest Land Management Project in line with the Save Our Watershed or SOW campaign activities. The first session conducted last 4 August 2021 discussed about the valuation of watershed ecosystem services for policy, both uh, the Philippine and the Malaysian experience. Today's lecture will revolve around the key features, functions, and the current status of the watersheds in our country. The forest management, forest land management project is a 10 year loan project with the assistance of the Japan International Cooperation Agency or JICA, focusing on forest and watershed interventions in the following river basins, the upper Magat and Cagayan covering the provinces of Ifugao in the Cordillera administrative region, Nueva Vizcaya and Quirino in the Cagayan Valley region, the upper Pampanga river basin in Nueva Ecija in region three or central Luzon region and the Halao river basin in the Iloilo province in region six or Western Visayas. The SOW campaign is an initiative of the project being part of its advocacy to preserve and sustain its investments through strengthening partnerships with the watershed management bodies, councils, local government units, and the private sector. At the national scale, it intends to draw policy for a collaborative watershed management and governance. This campaign was launched as a culminating activity of the Environment Month last 30 June by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources through the leadership of Secretary Roy A. Simatu. Said activity was participated by various key officials and representatives coming from the national government agencies, partner local government units, non-government organizations, the private sector, and the media. Aside from the webinar series, various post-launching activities and local initiatives, such as tree planting, forums, and photography contests, among others, will be conducted in the project covered provinces I uh, already mentioned, namely Ifugao, Nueva Vizcaya, Quirino, Nueva Ecija, and Iloilo. As committed during the national launching, I am glad to announce that the draft executive order that will institutionalize sustainable and integrated management of the watersheds in the country in a holistic, collaborative, and science-based manner had already been presented and discussed with the department's policy technical working group uh, last 17 of August and now undergoing vetting by the senior officials. This will uh, hopefully be submitted to the office of the president within the fourth quarter as uh, promised for uh, pre the president's approval through the various channels. About the webinars, we are in the second out of five sessions of this series that will run until November 2021. And the three succeeding topics would cover the following. 
sustainable watershed management, enhancing and sustaining stakeholders' participation in watershed management and science-based watershed management planning. Thus, I am encouraging all of us here to participate in today's session and in the next ones. Let us exchange ideas and learn more about our watersheds to equip ourselves in sustaining and conserving them. Moreover, I am inviting everyone to visit and follow the social media accounts of the SOW campaign in Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to keep yourselves updated on activities lined up and uh, for everyone to be able to join towards sustainable watershed management. I hope for the success of this activity and I would like to end by imparting SOW's campaign's main message. Saving watersheds is saving lives. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Very well said. And now we will be moving on to the paper presentations. May I now call on my colleague, Forrester Judith Castillo, to introduce our research speakers today. Thank you, Michiko. Good afternoon, everyone. Our first topic for today's webinar, Watershed Key Concepts and Functions, will be delivered by Dr. Rex Victor O. Cruz. Dr. Cruz is a retired professor at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, College of Forestry and Natural Resources. He obtained his bachelor and master's degrees in forestry at UPLD and his doctoral degree in watershed management at the University of Arizona, USA. Dr. Cruz is well known in the area of watershed management since majority of his works focus on watersheds. In the past, Dr. Cruz served as FDC director, CFNR dean, and UPLB chancellor. Currently, he serves as member of the People's Survival Fund Board and board of directors of the Asia Pacific Forestry Network for Sustainable Forest Management and Rehabilitation. Also, he is one of the authors of the second, third, and fourth IPCC assessment reports. In recognition of his exemplary contribution to science and technology, he became a member of the National Academy of Science and Technology in 2019. And to deliver the topic on the current status of the Philippine watersheds, we have Forrester Alicia L. Castillo. Forrester Castillo is currently the Supervising Forest Management Specialist of the Watershed Ecosystem Management Section of the Forest Resources Conservation Division of FMB. She obtained her bachelor's degree in forestry at UPLB College of Forestry and Natural Resources, Master in Public Management from UP Diliman, and Master in Environment Management from the University of Kitakyushu in Japan. Her fellowship includes the Australian Leadership Award. Forrester Castillo also ranked number three in Forrester's board examination in 1988. And without further ado, may we call on Dr. Rex Victor O. Cruz to be followed by Forrester Alicia L. Castillo for their presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm no longer a member of the uh, board of directors of the Asia Pacific Forestry Network. I was replaced by uh, Dr. Marge uh, Calderon, just for uh, uh, information of everyone. Um, good afternoon to everyone, to all who are joining with us here in this Zoom uh, platform and uh, who are joining with us uh, through uh, Facebook Live. Um, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat and good afternoon to everyone. I hope I can speak in English and Tagalog as uh, 
you know, as uh, I can better express some of the things that I will be sharing, although I was, uh, you know, I, I heard before that uh, we have uh, uh, foreign participants, so I'll try my best, you know, not to speak so much in uh, our language. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with you um, a, uh, you know, a discussion on uh, the basic concepts of a watershed. When uh, I was approached by a forestry development center to uh, uh, to uh, uh, put together these uh, learning sessions uh, for the uh, uh, forest land management uh, program, and uh, through the uh, of course uh, facilitation of uh, FDC, uh, I uh, actually, you know, I actually suggested that you know let's begin from the very elementary because. Uh, you know, we cannot underestimate the uh, remaining misconceptions and uh, remaining uh, inadequate appreciation of what uh, a watershed is by concept, you know. And uh, therefore, you know, uh, we are beginning from the very uh, fundamental of it, consider this to be a refresher for those who have uh, taken up uh, watershed management in their uh, bachelor or master of graduate degrees, uh, graduate studies. Uh, uh, this is just a refresher for you then, but uh, to all others, I hope that uh, this is something that will clarify what, um, what you know about watershed management of in the, in the past. I'd like to also, of course, uh, greet the Director of uh, Forest Management Bureau, ASEC uh, Mars Amaro, who is uh, um, actively leading FMB, you know, in this uh, program on saving, on save our watershed, you know, which is a very laudable program and uh, one program that I will not miss to support, you know. And uh, of course, uh, um, if our Dean is still there, uh, I also, you know, uh, pay my special uh, greetings to our Dean and to all uh, the officials of DNR who are here with us, and uh, I'm privileged to be uh, making a presentation uh, before you this afternoon. Let me now share my screen. Again, okay, um, I hope that uh, my screen is visible to everyone. My uh, topic for this uh, afternoon will be uh, watershed key features and uh, functions. Again, as I said, you know, this is really going back to the uh, uh, management uh, watershed 101. You know, uh, just a review and refresher for uh, many of us. You know, who have uh, technical background on uh, on watershed uh, management and. Uh, I was listening also to the video that was uh, that was uh, played before we started our program, and uh, you might as well be listening to it again, and uh, and you won't miss anything that I will be lecturing to you. You know, uh, I just um, uh, the 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 video played to you is uh, very much the same as my uh, presentation. Let me begin with the definition of a watershed. The watershed is a topographically delineated area drained by a river system with a single outlet. So um, I think uh, everybody knows this by heart, those who are, you know, those who are uh, engaged in watershed management. Okay? It's a specific landform. It is natural landform. And the boundary is not dictated by law. It's not specified by law, but it is defined physically, okay? And it is natural. It's a natural landform. Okay, its boundary is well defined. And um, uh, uh, you know, listening also to the video, you know, talking about the primary function of a watershed, you know, that it's uh, it, it's meant to capture you know rainwater and store most of it underground so that it can be gradually released to the streams, you know especially during dry season when we don't have much uh, rain and uh, surface uh, runoff. But this is a watershed, okay? I hope that everybody, you know, uh, is uh, clear about this. And um, 
A watershed, again, is subdivided or divided by uh, boundaries, and these boundaries are very physical. They are topographic, and uh, usually, you know, uh, we refer to the boundary of watershed as the ridge, okay, or technically known, you know, as uh, divide. And of course, you can imagine why, you know, why the boundary of a watershed is referred to as divide. And it is because it is the line of partitioning rainfall, you know, between two adjacent watershed. So yun yung ano, that's the, uh, that's the line that divides or partition the rainfall that falls, you know, on the ground. And um, uh, in, in the watershed, there are river systems. And these river systems are the drainage, okay? The drainage systems that uh, carry or drain the water out of the watershed, okay? Whether uh, the water coming from direct surface runoff or water that is uh, fed up, you know, by groundwater flow, you know, these are the water that, uh, rainwater that, uh, it, that infiltrated into the ground and uh, came out of uh, uh, the rivers, you know, through time. And these river systems are draining to a main river, and this main river drains to its outlet. And the outlet can be another river, a bigger river, or it can be a lake, or it can be uh, it can be straight to the coastal area or the sea. All right. Now, when we talk about um, uh, <coughs> when we talk about a watershed and uh, 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 we, you know, uh, we talk about the river system. It is important that, uh, you know, there is just one outlet, you know, that we're talking about, okay? There can be no two outlets for one watershed. Although closer to the coastal area, you will see that um, the main river will branch out simply because of the topography, which is flat. And usually the, the soil material are not very stable, you know, not very mature and that they can easily be uh, they can easily be uh, uh, channelized, okay, by uh, excessive uh, flow from the main river, and that they can branch out, you know, towards uh, the coastal area. But nonetheless, you know, the outlet is supposed to be just one, you know, just one uh, outlet that uh, collects all the rainwater that um, uh, that falls inside the inside the watershed you know that there are three types of streams, right? Ephemeral, intermittent, and perennial. And uh, perennial is a river, type of river or stream that flows all year round. Intermittent streams are, you know, are flowing only during the wet season. And ephemeral streams are flowing only whenever it rains, okay? So those are the three types of streams that uh, we have. Of course, most of our big streams are perennial with water all year round. And if you look at the watershed, the watershed is, is a nested, you know, it's a nested, uh, nested watershed of different sizes from the largest, you know, to the smallest. And the smallest watershed is, is that uh, area of uh, area that collects rainwater with a single, with a single stream. Okay, with a single stream in it. Okay, that's what we refer to as uh, as um, uh, as a, the smallest, no, smallest, uh, smallest watershed that we can uh, that we can delineate, you know, on the ground or on the on the map. Now. Here in, in the Philippines, and I'm, I don't know whether Alice will cover this, you know, because this is more of a, you know, this is more of a policy uh, concern. You know, here in the Philippines, we uh, classify, you know, we classify our watershed in terms of uh, sizes, you know, in terms of the area, such that those watersheds with area uh, less than 1,000 hectares, you know, we refer to as catchment, you know, or sometimes micro watershed or micro micro catchment, okay? And um, uh, as you can see, you know, as you can see, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a small watershed, you know, but uh, nonetheless, it can be critical in, you know, in, uh, uh, with respect to its uh, particular resources that uh, are found within the watershed, you know, not only water, but also other natural resources that may be, that may be there, okay? Now, 
uh, please bear in mind that uh, uh, among the watersheds, large, medium, small, no micro, the micro or the smaller, what the smaller the watershed is, the more sensitive that watershed is to changes in climate, in land cover, land use, and other human activities. So if you have a watershed that is very small, you know, it you have to be very careful because it can, you know, it is sensitive and can respond very quickly to any changes that you introduce into the watershed. And if such change happen in a way that is uh, damaging, you know, to the functions of the watershed, then uh, you know, then uh, uh, you will be in you will be in a lot of uh, trouble, you know, dealing with those kinds of problems. So the smaller the watershed, the more careful we must be, you know, in dealing with them because they are more sensitive to changes. And then small watersheds are uh, areas, you know, are watershed with areas between 1,000 to 10,000 hectares. And medium watershed has area between 10,000 and uh, 50,000 and large watershed is between 50 to 100,000. And of course, watersheds beyond 100, uh, beyond 100,000 hectares uh, in area is referred to as river basin. You know? River basin, and, and you know which is the largest watershed in the Philippines. Uh, it's the Cagayan River Basin, okay, with an area of uh, almost 3 million hectares, followed by, uh, of course, the next largest is in Mindanao, the Mindanao river basin with almost uh, 2 million hectares in area. Now, if you look at the Cagayan River Basin, uh, the boundary is defined by the Sierra Madre, Sierra Madre mountain range in the eastern portion. And then um, uh, imagine that all the water coming down from the western side of the ridge of the, uh, of the Sierra Madre draining towards uh, Cagayan River. And then uh, towards the southern part, you know, the southern ridge is actually defined by the Caraballo mountain ranges. Again, all those water north of the ridge of Caraballo drains to Cagayan River. And then on the west, you have the Cordillera, Cordillera mountain range. And again, all the water east of the ridge of Cordillera drains its water to uh, Cagayan River. And all this water are draining to uh, uh, towards the single outlet, you know. Um, and this is, again, this is the largest watershed that, uh, that we have, you know, in the Philippines. And uh, uh, while, you know, while we have uh, a different term for this, and sometimes it creates, uh, it creates a confusion, you know, that uh, seem to imply that uh, river basins are different, um, are different, entity than a watershed, you know, they're not, they're the same. They're watershed, just the same, except that their area is greater than 100,000 hectares, okay? And, uh, you know, what is challenging actually in managing watersheds in the Philippines is that uh, uh, there are many uh, local government units that share jurisdiction over uh, most of our large watersheds, such as, for instance, uh, Cagayan River Basin is being shared by uh, eight provinces, and it is bounded by three mountain, largest mountain ranges, as what, uh, you know, we just saw. And it is within what? How many regions are actually, uh, uh, are actually uh, uh, covering um, uh, Cagayan River Basin? You know, if we have a region one car and region, uh, region two. Um, and usually, you know, that's the challenge, you know, if you have a lot of, uh, uh, if, if you have a lot of LGUs, you know, sharing jurisdiction over watershed, the problem of coordination of development activities inside the watershed is always a pro, is always a challenge, you know, but uh, nonetheless, it's a challenge that we must overcome. And then um, uh, in Mindanao, uh, we also have, uh, Agus River Basin, and this is just to show you that uh, that watersheds, you know, again, you know, may uh, may drain to a may drain to a part of a large uh, river basin. Okay, so the uh, uh, 
Lake Lanao is actually, you know, within the Agus River Basin. It's part of the Agus River Basin. And Agus River Basin is important in terms of hydropower electric generation. Another river basin in uh, Mindanao, uh, the same um, uh, originating from almost the same ridge, uh, the Tagoloan River Basin. And Tagoloan River Basin is uh, uh, draining uh, towards the uh, outlet, you know, in uh, somewhere in uh, uh, yeah, somewhere there in Cagayan, uh, Cagayan de Oro, and then um, uh, just pointing out to you, you know, that uh, if you have a very large watershed or river basin uh, towards its outlet, there is usually a landform that. Uh, that is that is formed, you know, by uh, siltations and um, the soil erosion that happens, you know, in the upstream areas. All the silt, all the sediments are slowly building up uh, a landform which is called a delta, you know. And usually that delta is uh, used, you know, as a prime location for urban development and uh, and uh, commercial and industrial development. But uh, of course. We know what's the associated problems, you know, when you're using the delta, it is just fully flood, okay? And uh, that is the problem with, uh, uh, with delta areas, you know, in uh, many uh, parts of our country, which is being used uh, as prime location for urban development. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, this just delta that I just want to point out there. And then the Bicol River Basin is a, um, is a you know, it's a river basin where, uh, uh, where probably you can see the, 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 the least amount of forest cover, no? Siguro, this is the, the I mean, this is probably the, uh, the uh, river basin with the least uh, forest cover, you know, among all the, uh, major river basins that we have in the in the Philippines, and uh, uh, as you may imagine, you know, uh, they can have uh, many different problems associated with that, uh, including um, excessive runoff during uh, during uh, rainy season. You know that can uh, aggravate the uh, flood prone. You know uh, the the that, that can aggravate the uh, flood occurrences. You know that is naturally occurring in the uh, floodplain of the Bicol River Basin. Now, um, in the Philippines, based on our definition, we have many watersheds. No, we have many watersheds, and uh, uh, a watershed can, you know, uh, oh, sorry, one LGU can have many watersheds inside it. And this is the, for instance, this is the town of uh, General Nakar, and General Nakar. You know, have many watersheds inside it. You know? uh, it has uh, three uh, large, uh, three large watershed. You know? the Kaliwa, Kanan, and the Omirai, Omirai watershed, and it has uh, more than thirteen smaller watersheds towards the coastal area. And uh, that is the situation. You know, in our country, most of our land area, most of our political units are subdivided or can be subdivided into smaller or uh, not really smaller watersheds, but that, that can be subdivided into different sized uh, watershed units. Now, this, it, it is at this point that I'd like to mention, you know, mention that uh, when we refer strictly to a watershed, one whole watershed that is, we are referring actually to a watershed that extends its um, area, that extends, that spans rather, that spans from the ridge all the way to the coastal area. Okay, and that we refer to as strictly one whole watershed. Okay, that it's not draining to a larger river or it's not draining to a to a lake, but it drains directly to the sea. And that's it, that's what we strictly refer to as one whole one whole watershed. Now take a look at these smaller watersheds. The smaller watersheds here along the coastline, they are whole watershed. They are small, but they are one whole watershed. Okay, by itself because they don't drain to another river. Okay, they drain out to the sea. So these are all individual whole watersheds. Now take a look at this. 
This is Canaan watershed and this is Kaliwa watershed. Where do they drain? They don't drain to the coastal area. They drain actually to, to a larger river, which is called the Agus River. Okay. And they are actually part of the Agus, um, Agus watershed. Okay. They are just actually sub watersheds, but because they are, you know, they are, uh, uh, they are large in themselves and also very important, you know, uh, in terms of uh, water resources and biodiversity, you know, we refer to them as individual watershed when in fact, Kanan and Kaliwa watershed are just sub watersheds, okay, are just sub watersheds, but Umirai watershed is a whole watershed because it drains out to the coastal, uh, to the coastal area. Okay, so I hope that is clear. Okay, when we talk of one whole watershed, we're talking about a watershed that drains its water directly to the sea and not to another river or not to a lake. Okay, if it drains to another river or to a lake, then it is, or then it is only a sub watershed of a larger or a whole watershed. Um, I'd like to uh, mention here that um, uh, General Nakar is the first uh, LGU, you know, which used or adapted the watershed unit for updating their CLUP and for developing their LCCAP and DRRMP. We actually provided technical assistance to, uh, to General Nakar, you know, uh, and uh, uh, it was, you know, it was very exciting for us because uh, it was actually the initiative of the LGU, you know, of the mayor of General Nakar, that uh, we were asked, you know, to uh, help them uh, in this particular uh, in this particular activity, and uh, you know, it was not it was not really a uh, uh, there was not really a long discussion on what uh, what planning unit you know we will adopt. Uh, once we uh, propose that, you know, we will use the watershed unit for updating CLUP and LCCAP and DRRMP day right away, you know, agreed and supported that. And of course, you know, we know that that is how it should be, you know, as is specified in the HLURB guideline. So uh, I, uh, 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 General Nakar is a case, you know, it's a case that we, that we can use to demonstrate that the watershed <clears throat> Watershed plans can be the mother plan, okay. Especially the zoning within a watershed, okay, can be the mother physical framework for the development of CLUP, LCCAP, DRRMP, FLUP, Agriculture Development Plan, Tourism Plan, Infrastructure Development Plan, and other sectoral plan, you know, uh, with spatial development activities, okay. So we have done that for General Nakar. We developed the uh, management plans for <clears throat> the three major watersheds and uh, for the, the smaller watersheds, and then use this as basis for updating their CLUP, for developing their LCCAP, DRMP, and uh, for updating their uh, FLUP, you know, ADP and tourism plan and other plans. Okay, and in that way, you know, in that way uh, we are uh, confident that uh, these plans are, you know, spatially integrated and coordinated because they are emanating from one mother uh, plan used as physical framework and that is the watershed management plan. This is the province of uh, Aurora and as you can see uh, Aurora province can be subdivided into different um, uh, into different uh, watershed units and um, uh, 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 the province of Aurora uh, also developed their uh, their LC cap, you know, uh, using uh, the watershed uh, unit, you know, and we also provided assistance uh, to uh, the province of uh, Aurora. Uh, we have um, started um, uh, developing their watershed uh, plans for uh, one of their largest, you know, and this and uh, this particular uh, area. Uh, where Baler and uh, San Luis and a portion of uh, uh, Maria Aurora, you know, are actually uh, located, you know, but uh, we haven't started, um, we haven't started our assistance in uh, updating their CLUP based on the watershed plans that uh, 
we develop for them. Okay, so one province can be subdivided into watershed units. This is another province, you know, Lanao del Norte, uh, where you know you can subdivide, you know, subdivide the entire province into watershed units and. Just like Aurora, you know, it was easy to do it because the boundary of uh, the boundary of Lanao in the uh, upper portion, upper elevation, is actually following the ridge line, you know, of the mountains. And hence, you know, uh, towards the uh, northwestern side, to towards the northwestern side of the of the province, you know, towards the uh, 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 Pangil Bay, you know, uh, you have all the watersheds, you know, draining its water to the bay. Okay, and these are all these uh, watershed units, you know, that drain all the way to to the um, uh, to uh, to Pangil Bay. Okay, so uh, this is this is Lanao Province, Lanao del Norte, subdivided into its different uh, watersheds. By the way, they are also the first province that adopted watershed as unit for preparing their. Uh, uh, Actually, for preparing their CLUPs, um, uh, many of them don't. Many of the LGUs there don't have uh, CLUPs at the time that we assisted them, and for developing the provincial physical framework plan. This is the island of Samar, and as you can see, Samar can be subdivided into many large uh, watersheds, you know, with smaller watersheds along the coastline. And then this is the island of uh, Negros. No, used to be a uh, region, a um, uh, region what? Region seventeen was it? No, but which of course uh, reverted to its original uh, uh, classification as part of region seven and region six. So um, again, you know, Negros Island can be subdivided into different watershed units. You know, such as what you see there. Okay. Uh, many watersheds, as I said before, are shared by several LGUs, you know, and this is the reality. This is Amburayan uh, watershed, you know, in uh, in CAR and Region One. It um, it originates from CAR and drains its water to uh, to uh, La Union, you know, in uh, in Region in Region One, of course, between uh, uh, between Tagudin and. Uh, Sorry, it um, uh, it it drains to uh, yeah, it drains to uh, Tagodin, you know, and between Tagodin and uh, Bangar, you know, so shared between uh, La Union and uh, Ilocos Sur. Okay, so this uh, this watershed, you know, is uh, shared by ten LGUs, meaning to say municipalities and cities, three provinces and two. And two regions again, as I said, you know, the challenge is how do you coordinate? You know, how do you co coordinate the development happening here in the upstream areas, uh, in Benguet Province, for instance? You know, how do you coordinate that with what Ilocos were wanted, you know, wants to do in their area and what um, La Union wants to do in their part of the watershed? Okay, such that at the end of it all, you know, when all these development are happening. Okay, uh, the watershed, you know, remains in sustainable and healthy condition. And that is, of course, the challenge, you know, easier said than done. But uh, of course, a challenge is always there because local government units usually don't have the same priorities. They usually don't have uh, the, same, uh, uh, the same preferences as to the trajectory of development that they want to, uh, they want to pursue. Okay, so. Let us go back now to the. Uh, let's go back now to the uh, uh, main function of a watershed. Okay, why is you know why is a watershed important? Well, it's it's important because it is you know it, it is the 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 uh, it is the venue you know that captures rainwater for us, and uh, this most of this rainwater are supposed to be uh, channeled to the groundwater storage. Okay, so that uh, this uh, stored rainwater underground can be the source of water supplying our rivers, especially during dry season. Okay, of course, uh, water draining to the river, you know, can happen all year round. You know, for as long as the 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 level of groundwater is above, you know, 
is above the stream bed that it can continue to supply water to uh, to the streams all year round. Okay, even in even in um, even in dry uh, season or summer season. Okay, the reason why why uh, rivers you know some rivers dry up during the dry season is because their groundwater flow you know drops down. Okay, drops down below the stream bed, especially when there's no more rain recharging the water that goes out of the groundwater, okay? So if the groundwater level drops below the stream bed, then it can no longer uh, supply water to the stream, the river uh, dries up when there is no rain. So that is the, that is the, the, that is the primary function of a watershed. And the primary task of a watershed manager is then what? The primary task of a watershed manager is to maximize the amount of rainwater stored underground. And how does a watershed, you know, how does how does a manager, by the way, you know, achieve that? How does he achieve uh, maximization of uh, the amount of water stored underground? The key, of course, is to protect the soil at all times. Okay. The key to maximum storage of rainwater underground is the protection of soil at all time. Okay, do whatever you want to do in the watershed, but make sure that at the end of the day, the soil is protected against damaging impacts that can disturb its ability or impair its ability to infiltrate uh, to infiltrate water. Okay, hence a watershed manager, you know, is a manager of uh, activities that's happening inside the watershed to make sure that those activities do not unduly impair the infiltration ability of the soil, okay? So that's the primary task of, of a manager. So in a watershed, there are two types of resources that we are dealing with. You know, the surface water, these are the water that you see on the surface of the ground, lakes, rivers, you know, uh, surface runoff when it's raining, okay, and the uh, groundwater resources, which are, you know, which is, by the way, the, the, which is the water that are, that is stored under, that is stored underground, okay. So both of these water resources are important consideration for uh, watershed management, okay, we want to make sure that, uh, the surface water resources are uh, protected from uh, protected from uh, being you know being uh, impaired okay because most of our surface water especially water uh, flowing down our river systems are used for many different uh, purposes mostly for agricultural purposes and hence you know it's important to ensure that surface water continues uh, to flow, especially at the time when irrigation is needed, that is during summer months. And then the groundwater storage is important as well, because uh, uh, surface water is a major source of uh, domestic water supply and water supplying uh, commercial industrial uh, uses. Okay, and uh, again, you know, uh, uh, without uh, without protecting the rainwater, then we will. Uh, we will have a problem, you know, in dealing with, uh, uh, in administering, you know, the use of uh, water for different purposes. Watershed is made up of interconnected ecosystems. So if you look at, you know, if you look at the, this particular uh, watershed, you know, uh, watershed, you know, is made up of a mosaic of different land uses, or you can look at it as mosaic of different uh, interconnected ecosystems, okay? It's a landscape unit, okay? It's a landscape unit. And, um, and uh, what you see, you know, are, uh, what you see are, are, are interconnections, you know, are interconnections that are um, making, you know, that makes, the entire watershed, you know, function functions as it is. Okay, the many many ecosystem services that a watershed delivers are dependent upon the uh, dependent upon the uh, the the health and condition of these interconnected 
ecosystem. In watershed management, in watershed management, we make sure that any changes that we introduce in any of this ecosystem within the landscape, you know, happen in such a way that the that the series or chain of reactions of uh, of impacts are kept within uh, within uh, acceptable limits or tolerable limits. You know, uh, we cannot. You know, it is inevitable that uh, if you introduce anything in the watershed, okay. Uh, it is inevitable. It is inevitable that 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 the watershed will change. You know that all the other ecosystems in the watershed will actually change. Okay, some will be insignificantly, and some will be significantly changing depending on the type of changes that you introduce. Okay, or depending on the you know amount of, uh, for instance, a change in uh, climate conditions. You know, uh, the, the watershed will change. And that change, you know, will will uh, cascade, you know, from the upstream areas all the way to the midstream, downstream, and coastal and coastal area. Okay, and uh, again, you know, uh, a manager must be able to have this context. You know, when he are, when 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 he is managing a watershed, okay, he's not only focusing on the forest area. Okay, uh, gone are the days when we talk about watershed management as uh, you know as management of the areas that are covered with forest and which we, which we normally refer to at that time, you know, uh, years ago, you know, as the watershed, okay? The watershed is the whole landscape. When you are a manager of the watershed, you manage the whole landscape from the ridge all the way to the coastal, to the coastal area, okay? When you make decisions, okay, when you make decision, it has to be within that context. Any decision that you want to implement in a watershed must be, you know, must be within the context of the entire watershed unit. Okay, uh, meaning, you know, you have studied very well uh, what will be the consequences of any particular decision, you know, that you make on the entire watershed and not just on the forest part of the watershed or uh, the uh, grassland part of the watershed and so on. Sorry. There's another, uh, there's another warning from uh, NDRRMC. Sorry, I have a better, uh, yeah. Anyway, in a watershed also, you know, um, uh, we have what we call service producing area and we have service receiving area, okay? Uh, I think I have a better slide actually ahead of this. Um, but, uh, you know, at this point, uh, I'd like to just mention that uh, uh, forest area are usually the service producing area and the service re receiving area are usually the uh, lowland agriculture, you know, the grassland areas, lakes and wetlands, uh, urban areas, coastal and marine areas, okay? They receive the, the services produced by the uh, forest ecosystems, okay? And, uh, uh, for, for instance, for lakes and wetlands and for agro ecosystems, they receive services from the, uh, from the uh, uh, forest ecosystems, but at the same time also they use these services in producing uh, other services that they then deliver to uh, other, uh, other ecosystems such as the urban ecosystems. So it's that kind of an interaction you know, that we must be aware of. It's not enough, you know, it's not enough to uh, to know that you are protecting the services produced, uh, being produced by an ecosystem, but uh, it is also important that you consider what type and what uh, quality of uh, ecosystem services are needed or required to be able to maintain okay, or to sustain the uh, functioning and services of the uh, other ecosystems uh, interconnected with it. Okay, so. Um, uh, I think we will we will have further discussion on this in our this uh, when we uh, when we discuss the second part of this uh, uh, management series, a uh, watershed management series. All right. Uh, um, in our watershed, we're dealing with many. Uh, with many interconnected problems, you know, we have interconnected ecosystems, and hence we have interconnected problems. 
you know in the forest part of the watershed we have encroachment we have loss of biodiversity we have deforestation and forest degradation forest fragmentation forest cover loss you know soil erosion etc so we have those problems in the agro ecosystems you know that includes agriculture uh, uh, agroforestry you know and we can even include your grassland we have the problem of land conversion soil degradation and diminishing land uh, diminishing land productivity and in the urban area you know we have all of this now these are all interconnected you know these are all interconnected uh, and uh, when we try to you know when when we try to manage a watershed we have to be you know we have to be wary of this okay uh, we have to make sure you know we have to make sure that in solving one problem we are not actually uh, we are not actually creating another problem or we are not uh, aggravating uh, an existing problem in other parts of the watershed and it has to be that uh, that consciousness you know about about uh, uh, how a watershed is behaving you know and it's behaving in such a way that uh, in such a way that uh, the problems that it deals with are interconnected okay so just uh, you know just so that we know how to make sure you know and all those as well make sure that um, uh, when we try to solve one problem you know we actually solve it in a comprehensive manner okay without uh, compromising or without uh, aggravating the other problems at hand um one of the major problem that we are major problems that we are dealing with in our watershed dr x yes this is a gen dr x this is a gentle reminder to kindly wrap up your presentation thank you sir okay so uh, uh, all right um um one of the major problems that we are dealing with you know in many of our watersheds you know is um, uh, forest cover loss okay and uh, we are always of course you know we are always uh, pointing our fingers to illegal logging you know in the past and rightly so you know many of them are actually due to logging both illegal and legal you know and uh, but you know what uh, what we have to realize is that uh, agriculture driven forest cover losses is still ongoing you know and globally it is projected that it will go on it will continue and this will be a challenge that we need to uh, we need to address you know how to make sure that uh, agriculture uh, expands and intensifies without actually uh, encroaching into our natural uh, natural forest area because uh, then you know we will be solving again that's what i was referring to we will be solving the problem of food production but at this, but at the same time also we will be creating problems by encroaching into the forest uh, into the forest area and uh, we know that for that uh, uh, yeah so basically uh, deforestation will have an impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions you know and uh, aside from uh, uh, other uh, uh, other consequences you know that uh, we don't we don't want okay so uh, i think i'll end here you know let me just finish this slide okay in a watershed i don't know what happened to my uh, okay in a watershed you know um the um, uh, any change you know any change that we make you know in terms of land use okay any decision that we make will have consequences on the quality and quantity of of uh, ecosystem services you know that we have you know for instance the greenhouse gas emission you know biodiversity water and uh, food you know um, any change in land use within the watershed will have impacts on this you know if we for instance if we begin with forest grass you know agriculture urban areas and decided to retain the original use that will have an implication on how much greenhouse gas emission uh, will there be and then how much biodiversity gain or loss how much water gain or loss and how much food gain or loss now if we decide that um, we keep forest as it is and then convert grassland and agriculture to forest then that will also have implications on emission biodiversity water and food if we convert forests and brushland to agriculture that will also have a corresponding 
uh, in, uh, consequence on the amount of ecosystem services. And uh, if we you know, decide to convert forest, grass, and agriculture to urban, then that will also have its own consequences. So if you are a manager, if you are a manager of a watershed, these are the things that you have to be uh, aware of, you know, that your watershed is, um, is made up of many parts interacting with one another. Watersheds interacting with one another, some watersheds interacting with one another, land uses that interacts with one another. So that if you change one part, one use in the watershed, your ecosystem services are going to uh, are going to change, okay? And some changes can be negative. All right, so I'll end here, and uh, um, you know, give up the microphone back to our facilitator. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we will hear from our next speaker, Forrester Alicia Castillo, to talk about about the current status of the Philippine watersheds. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alicia El Castillo from the Forest Management Bureau. First of all, we would like to extend our gratitude to all the organizers of this webinar for inviting us to present the state of the Philippine watersheds. As we are virtually here at the University of the Philippines College of Forestry and Natural Resources, we will try to present a science-based status of our Philippine watersheds. Our presentation is divided into four topics. First would be the background on watershed. Then we would be discussing the framework being adopted by the DNR on integrated watershed management planning. Thirdly, we would all have a look at the status of the watershed management planning and activities. Lastly, we will be discussing some of the key priority issues and challenges in watershed management. As an introduction, the whole of our country could be considered as a watershed with around 15.7 million hectares or 53% classified forest land and 14.1 million hectares or 47% classified as alienable and disposable land. In terms of forest cover, this line graph shows us that from 1934 to 2009, our watersheds have been deforested at a rate of 134,133 hectares per year. However, from 2010 to 2015, the forest cover within our watersheds has been increasing at a rate of 34,000 hectares per year. Hence, in 2015, the forest cover within our watersheds is around 7.01 million hectares or 23%. But how does this 23% forest cover within our watersheds affect the condition of our watersheds? We are always being asked on how much should be the ideal forest cover in our watersheds in order for our watersheds to provide a steady and sustainable supply of quality water. Expert opinions will tell us that a 100% fully covered watershed might only supply a little amount of water, while a degraded watershed might bring about too much water or plus floods. So is this 23% forest cover too little for our watersheds? These are the current situations in our watersheds. Some of our watersheds are being threatened by the presence of dump sites, illegal settlers, and not enough good forest cover. On the other hand, very few of our watersheds have good intact forest cover. This is a simple illustration on the effects of forest cover on surface runoff and soil erosion. 
Due to the lack of any local study on this subject, we will use this study from the USA just for illustration purposes. In this study, a 10% ground covered with plants and litters is considered as poor ground cover and it will bring about a surface runoff of 75% rainfall and soil loss of around 21.13 tons per hectare. On the other hand, a 37% ground covered with plants and litters is considered as fair ground cover and it will bring about a surface runoff of 14% of rainfall and soil loss of around 1.24 tons per hectare. And a 60 to 75% ground covered with plants and litters is considered as good ground cover and it will bring about a surface runoff of only 2% of rainfall and soil loss of only 0.07 tons per hectare. But where does our 23% forest cover stands at? It stands in between poor ground cover and fair ground cover. Based on this study, a 23% forest cover might bring about an estimated 30% surface runoff and a soil loss of around 10 tons per hectare. But do these results hold true in the experiences that we have had in our watershed? Let us see. Before 2008, when the forest cover of our watersheds was only around 7.2 million hectares or about 24%, watershed management plans were only being prepared for the upland portions of our watersheds. With interventions that mainly focus on reforestation, information education campaign, forest protection, and establishment of soil and water conservation measures. Suddenly, these tragedies happened. Prior to 2008, most of the downstream portions of our watersheds were devastated by the flooding and landslide that resulted in the loss of several lives and properties. Hence, the DNR conducted several expert investigations, consultations, assessments, and evaluation on these tragic incidences in our watersheds. This led the DNR to revisit again how DNR is managing our watersheds, especially the critical watersheds. The DNR realized that watersheds should be managed using the watershed ecosystem management approach or the reach to reap approach as the conditions in the upstream portion of the watershed could affect the, the downstream portions and vice versa. The downstream portions of the watershed could also affect the conditions in the upper portions of the watershed like through migration of lowland farmers to the upland portion of the watershed. So in the formulation of the characterization report and watershed management plans, all the ecosystems from the forest down to the coastal and marine ecosystems are now being considered. Moreover, vulnerability assessment has been incorporated in the characterization report in order to determine which among our watersheds are prone to flooding and landslide. The Watershed Ecosystem Management Framework is currently being used in the preparation of the integrated watershed management plans in the country. Under the framework, watershed characterization and vulnerability assessments are being carried out from the forest ecosystem down to, to the coastal and marine ecosystem. Then, based on this characterization from vulnerability assessment reports, interventions would be prepared through the participatory approach with all the stakeholders within the watershed to address all the issues and problems identified from the forest down to the coastal and marine ecosystem. The DNR also recognizes that the stakeholders of the watershed are multidisciplinary, multisectoral, and varied. Hence, for a plan to be sustainable and effective, 
Integrated watershed management planning should be demand-driven and led by the local communities such as the watershed communities, people's organizations, and local government units. And they should be supported by the national government agencies, regional offices, and other agencies with policies and technical support as well as other assistance. To ensure the effective implementation of the Integrated Watershed Management Plan, its implementation should not only be the responsibility of the DENR, but it should be the responsibility of all the agencies and stakeholders within the particular watershed to facilitate and oversee that all the concerned agencies will do their part collaboratively in the management of the watershed a watershed management council should be formed to oversee and coordinate the implementation of the activities in the integrated watershed management plan. Funding support could be sourced from the national appropriations, stakeholders, and overseas development assistance. This slide shows the comparative cost estimate for watershed characterization, vulnerability assessment, and management planning. For small-scale watersheds, those watersheds that are equal or less than 10,000 hectares, the budget for watershed characterization and vulnerability assessment is 780,000 pesos, and the cost for its watershed management planning is 100. 20,000 pesos. So all in all, its total budget is 900,000 pesos. For medium-scale watershed, those watersheds uh, that are more than 10,000 hectares up to 50,000 hectares, the budget for the watershed characterization and vulnerability assessment is 960,000 pesos. And the budget allotted for its watershed management planning is 340,000 pesos for a total of 1.3 million. For large-scale watershed, those watersheds that are more than 50,000 hectares, the current budget for the watershed characterization and vulnerability assessment is 1.9 million pesos, and its budget for watershed management planning is 700,000 pesos, so its total budget is 2.6 million pesos. Before we can manage our watersheds based on the integrated or rich to reap framework, we need to know the coverage and boundaries of our watersheds. Hence, with the support of the Peel Lider Project of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, the Forest Management Bureau delineated the watersheds in the country. Upon delineation, we have confirmed that the areas and boundaries of river basins and river watersheds, such as the Abulug River Watershed, are the same such that it can be said that river basins and river watersheds are synonymous. As of date, we have around 2,224 reach to rip river watersheds. Of these, 18 are major river basins, 131 are priority critical watersheds supporting national irrigation system. These 131 priority critical watersheds supporting irrigation system are the DNR's priority targets in the preparation of characterization reports, home vulnerability assessment, and integrated watershed management plans. These are the priority targets of the DNR in support of the food production program of the Department of Agriculture. These are also the priority watersheds for the convergence program of the DNR, DA, and DAR. Of the 2,224 river watersheds, 113 of these are proclaimed watershed reservations which were proclaimed as such to improve water yield and reduce sedimentation. While the management of watersheds in an integrated manner is important, providing funds for its implementation is equally important. However, based on this data, 
only about 1% of the DNR's budget is allotted to watershed management activities. Nonetheless, the reforestation activities of our watersheds under the National Greening Program were allotted a bigger budget of about 16.9% of the total budget of the DNR. And the other important activity of our watershed, the Forest Protection Program, was allotted a slightly bigger budget of about 3.5% of the total budget of the DNR. At present, 45 or 34 percent out of the 131 priority critical watersheds supporting national irrigation systems have characterization cum vulnerability assessment reports. Of this, 15 or 11 percent have integrated watershed management plans. Another important activity in watershed management is the establishment of soil and water conservation measures. These soil and water conservation measures will control soil erosion and water degradation in our watersheds. This includes both st structural and vegetative measures. However, to address climate change within our watersheds, small water impounding system or spring development was added among the structural measures being established within our watersheds. These swiss or spring development are being established to provide the water requirement of the newly established plantations during the dry and drought seasons. At the same time, this swiss or spring development could also provide domestic water supply to the nearby or adjacent communities of the reforestation sites. From 2015 to 2020, we have already established 44,589 cubic meters of Swiss or spring development within our watersheds. Due to climate change, the DNR has also adopted the following structural measures to increase the water supply for the plantations being established in our watersheds. First is the small water impounding project, which is one of the small-scale irrigation technologies to address the problems on supply and allocation of water in certain watershed communities. Next is the small farm reservoir, which is a smaller version of SWEEP designed to collect rainfall and run up for use in a single farm. Another important watershed activity of the DNR is the establishment of science-based real-time watershed monitoring instruments within our watersheds. The real-time data that could be generated from these instruments could be stored in the long-term database that could be used in making science-based policies, science-based interventions, and science-based decisions in the sustainable management, development, and conservation of our watersheds. Moreover, this real-time data could also aid communities in disaster risk management. These are the instruments installed in our pilot watersheds. The automated weather station that measures, among others, rainfall, the automated water level station that measures the water level of rivers and the CTD groundwater sensor that measures the conductivity, temperature, and depth, which can give us an idea of the availability and quality of the groundwater within our watersheds. As of date, we have already installed 47 AWS 16 AWLS and 8 CTD groundwater sensors in our 30 pilot watersheds. One of the biggest programs of the DNR is the National Greening Program. Its major objectives, among others, are to engage upland communities in the rehabilitation of our watersheds and at the same time, improve their living conditions. In 2020, around 17,000 hectares were targeted for the development of the bamboo plantation. It benefited around 
3,500 families with an average additional monthly income of 10,000 pesos or $200. This graph shows that the highest accomplishments in terms of reforestation were recorded under the National Greening Program with the highest recorded data of more than 360,000 hectares in 2015. However, since 2017, Hello. the National Hello. Greening Program's Hello. accomplishment in terms of reforestation has been declining due to budget cuts. From 2011 to 2020, the National Greening Program has already reforested more than 2 million hectares of degraded areas within our watersheds. However, of the more than 2 million hectares reforested under the National Greening Program, only more than 64,000 hectares were located within the priority critical watersheds supporting the national irrigation system. Another milestone program implemented by the DNR within our watersheds is the logging ban under EO23. Under EO23, all logging concessions were closed in all natural and residual forests of our watersheds nationwide. Because of EO23, the illegal logging hotspots were significantly reduced from 197 to only 6 illegal logging hotspots or a decrease of 97%. The next slides will show us the five major challenges we are facing in the management of our watersheds. First, until now, we still do not have a policy on the creation of Watershed Management Council. The Watershed Management Councils are imperative in the implementation of the integrated watershed management plans, as they are the ones who will oversee and ensure that all the interventions in the integrated watershed management plans are being implemented collaboratively by all the agencies and stakeholders within a particular watershed. The Watershed Management Councils uh, will also play a major role in resolving conflicting issues and incompatible interests within our watersheds. The second issue in watershed management is the weak watershed database. Until now, we still do not have an online and interactive watershed information system where we can store, among others, the real-time data that we could obtain from our watershed installed science-based instruments. This online watershed database system is needed in order for us to have basis in formulating science-based policies, science-based decisions, and science-based interventions for the development, conservation, and management of our watersheds. Thirdly, our installed science-based instruments are still not enough to monitor our highly critical watersheds that are prone to flooding and landslide. However, we understand that before we could expand the coverage of our watersheds with science-based monitoring instruments, we still need to define our selection criteria first and capacitate our field personnel in the operationalization and analysis of the real-time data being generated by the science-based instruments. Fourthly, while we are already establishing the Swiss or spring development, we still lack the scientific basis for the volume required per hectare for our plantations as we still do not have any study yet on the water intake of the species planted. Said water intake per forest species is required in order for us to develop a more scientific basis for the volume of Swiss or spring development to be constructed. 
Lastly, we still lack the appropriate science-based water harvesting facilities that could supply the water requirement of our plantations during their early stages of growth and during the dry and drought seasons. Said water harvesting facilities are needed as the climate change has already been affecting the survival and growth of the plantations within our watersheds. That's all and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Forrester Castillo, and thank you, Dr. Cruz, for sharing your expertise on watersheds. This will surely contribute to our advocacy to save our watersheds. I'm sure our participants are brimming with questions and um, ready to discuss with our resource speakers. Do not worry, for we have collected your questions. We will do our best to share this with our resource speakers, if time permits. And so here are the house rules on how you will, how you can forward our questions to us. Please use the Q and A, the Q and A tab, so that we can uh, we can see your questions. And so so many questions are coming in right now, I guess, but. Before we move on to the Q&A, few reminders. E-certificates will be given after you accomplish the post-evaluation form. The link will be posted in the Zoom chat. Once accomplished, you may email us at fdc.uplb at up.edu.ph for the request of the presentations of the speakers. For those who wish to replay this webinar, you may find it on our Facebook page. All right, so right now, um, may I ask our speakers to kindly open your cameras so that we can proceed to the open forum. All right, Dr. Rex and Forrester Castillo. Hmm. I will just pin you here for, ayan, so that everyone can see us. All right. So here are the questions. So for our questions, um, it's not really directed po to any to any specific speaker, but uh, you may choose to answer or not. Po. Ayan. So this is the question. Please just tell me if I know you want to you, you want to answer. Po, okay. So this is the first question. How important is the passage or enactment of the National Land Use Act? and SFM bill in the management of our watersheds. While the bills are pending approval, do we have enough policies or programs that address issues in the watersheds? So that's the question. It's like a two question in one. Who would like to answer first? Yeah. Um, okay, sir. One of the one of the major problems, you know, that we are uh, addressing in watershed, you know, in watershed, many of our watersheds is actually the unregulated uh, land conversion. You know, I think uh, we have to recognize how uh, <clears throat> how very destructive this is, you know, and how long this can continue, you know, without uh, bringing us to the tipping point, you know, of our watershed degradation. We really need to regulate uh, the way we use our land, you know, in a watershed to make sure that uh, we understand the trade-offs. We understand, uh, you know, what we are getting into if we decide to uh, do something in, uh, in in certain parts of the watershed. So um, uh, we need to regulate, for instance, the way uh, we convert lands for agriculture, but also the way we convert agricultural lands to urban areas. Okay. And this is, you know, this is really something that we need to address uh, seriously, and that's why the National Land Use Act, you know, is going to be very, very important in this uh, regard. There has to be, you know, there has to be this kind of a framework that will allow us to decide, you know, in a uh, in a very wise manner, you know, the the way we use the lands in many of our watersheds. For the SFM bill, uh, it's um, yeah, it's something that uh, it's something that uh, will benefit as well, you know, the watershed management. Um, the uh, I, I think what uh, what will benefit from the sustain sustainable forest management uh, bill if it passes is that uh, it will 
uh, provide greater um, uh, greater stable uh, regulatory framework you know for engaging the local communities and for engaging the private sector i think this is what is you know this is what is missing right now you know if we can uh, if we can do this then uh, i think uh, you know we will be uh, we will be able to facilitate you know not only the not only the the the, the protection of watershed but also the uh, the uh, restoration of our uh, degraded forest lands. You know? um, I think we are still missing, you know, we are still missing the contribution of the private sector and we need a more stable and more, uh, more um, conducive uh, regulatory framework you know, to encourage them. Okay, thank you, sir, for that answer. Maybe Forrester Castillo would like to answer as well, if you have a follow-up po, ma'am. Thank you very much for that question. I agree with Dr. Cruz. The main problem in our watersheds is the degradation of our watersheds. And actually, right now, we are already implementing some of the activities and programs in the DNR, like as you have seen from the presentation, we have the National Greening Program, we have the Forest Protection, and we have the, of course, the first step to be able to know how to um, how to mitigate all those problems and issues uh, in our watersheds is the preparation of the integrated watershed management plan. Because in the preparation of the integrated watershed management plan, we would be able to know what are the problems from the upstream down to the coastal and marine. Like in the case of the Chico watershed, the problem in the lower portion, the LGU in Kalinga, their problem is a uh, uh, siltation of their rivers. And they have been dredging it and uh, they have been uh, using so much funds of their budget, but they, did, they do not know that the cause of their problem is the upper portion or the mountain province because the mountain province, what they are doing in their forest areas is that they are converting it to agricultural areas, they are planting vegetable even at the upper portions of their uh, watershed. So in effect, to be able really to address all the issues and concerns of the watershed, we have to prepare the integrated watershed management plan from the reach up to the coastal and marine because these problems, as mentioned by Dr. Cruz, are interrelated. So the solutions should be also interrelated. We should not only focus on the upper portion, but we should also take a look at what is happening at the downstream portion. So I think though I think what was mentioned or, or what were mentioned by Dr. Cruz are the main problems. And the main solution for us is to really prepare the integrated watershed management plan. But as of date, you have seen that only 1% of the budget of the DNR is being allotted to watershed management activities. So I think that is also a major concern. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for that answer. All right, so this um, question is directed at Sir Rex. Uh, this question came from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they asked, Sir, did you use remote sensing in delineating the watersheds of the municipalities you assisted? Thank you, sir, and more power. Um, did we use remote sensing? Um, I, I think yes for uh, analyzing the uh, land cover, um, but for delineating the boundary, you know, we just use the uh, the, uh, the contour map, you know, the um, uh, 10, 10 meter resolution uh, topographic map. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir, for that answer. All right, so this one, this question came from Kristen Balaod. Ayan. So Kristen, if you're here, your question is being announced na. What processes are involved in declaring a watershed, a watershed reserve or protected area? Any one of you can answer po, Ma'am Castillo or Sir Cruz. Sir Cruz? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Sir Cruz. Thank you for that question. Uh, actually, in the uh, there are steps to be done or to be carried out in the 
protected either as a watershed reservation or either as a protected area. Actually, in the in the proclamation of an area as a watershed reservation, the it's, there should be a request either from the local government units or from the stakeholders that they wanted this this watershed to be proclaimed as a watershed reservation. And uh, for example, it is being used as source of domestic water supply by the communities in that watershed. Then, or or that watershed has been degraded by by many factors. Then they could request for it to be declared as a watershed reservation, then they would go to their centro and then they would coordinate. Of course, they have to have a map of that area because you have to have, uh, you have to know the area that you wanted to proclaim as a watershed reservation. So they need assistance from the centro or the our, our local DNR offices. And they should also have the characterization and forest land use plan. And then they could submit it to the central office and then and then the central office would uh, uh they we would be we would be, we would be forwarding it to the office of the president for proclamation upon evaluating on whether that request for proclamation as watershed reservation is feasible and i think for the proclamation of a of an area as a as a protected area that should go to the congress and under the NIPAS law, there are 10 steps that should be uh, carried out. For example, uh, there should be a PASA, a, a, a suitability assessment that should be conducted. And then uh, upon knowing that it is suitable to be proclaimed as protected area, then it would also undergo the same process such as evaluation and then endorsement to the to the Congress for its proclamation as a protected area. I think that's a synopsis of these steps. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for that answer. And now there is a question directed at Sir Cruz. Um, what are the best approaches in addressing the problems cited by Dr. Rex Victor Cruz? So there's a question from our anonymous attendee. What are the best approaches, though, Paul? Sir? Um, I'm trying to recall what the, the problems that I mentioned is. I think uh, uh, forest cover loss is, uh, is one of them. And uh, I guess I, I just mentioned, you know, the need, to, uh, the need to rationalize the way we allocate our lands, the way we make land use decisions, you know, especially uh, assessing trade-offs between agriculture, forestry, urban areas. You know, this is really something that we need to fix. Otherwise, uh, land conversion is going to be uh, presenting us, you know, will be making a lot of problems uh, uh, to us. And then uh, 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 the other, the other, I, you know, if I can remember it right, you know, uh, I mentioned about one uh, river basin, the Bicol River Basin, with uh, uh, with forest cover of less than ten percent, you know, and that problem, you know, we can address that by. Uh, by intensifying our uh, restoration programs, you know, NGP is doing its job, and uh, you know we just we, we just need to uh, to uh, enhance you know the way uh, the way we do it so that we can get a better. Uh, I mean, we can enhance the results that uh, we're getting and um, and accelerate you know the way uh, we are we are recovering our uh, lost uh, forest. And then third is the challenge of uh, multi-agency or multi-LGUs within a watershed. You know, um, this is this is a real challenge. It's it it always you know it's always a uh, major challenge whenever we begin one project in a watershed, especially when it's all about planning. You know, because again, as I said, you know, not all LGUs within a one watershed you know share the same priorities. They're usually competing. They're usually uh, conflicting, and hence, you know, the, the, uh, there's there's really a need to uh, to be able to uh, unite these uh, different LGUs, you know, and uh, make them agree on a common vision for the watershed. That's you know, that's a challenge. But it's it's not you know, it's not a uh, it's not an impossible it's not an, an impossible task. You know, we have done that uh, in many in many watersheds, and um, you know. 
we just need to ano, we just need to uh, to persevere you know in uh, dealing with these kinds of problems so uh, yun lang yung mga naiisip kong mga problems you know that i mentioned uh, as part of my presentation okay thank you sir thank you sir for that answer now this next question is for forester alicia um this a uh, question is from Mai Lavinia of DNR PMD. He said, good afternoon. My concern is for Ms. Alice Castillo. Uh, have we crafted set of key indicators for sustainable watershed management? Do we have the corresponding assessment tool which we can use to assess efforts of all stakeholders? So that's the question for ma'am. Uh, should I repeat or? For sustainable management, criteria for sustainable management. Uh, key indicators for sustainable uh, watershed management, she said. Key indicators for sustainable management. Actually, all the indicators that we need for sustainable management is in the master plan, the master plan for forestry development. But if you want really an indicator for sustainable development, uh, for example, uh, a watershed, how much should be the forest area within that watershed to provide the sustainable supply of water? And then other, other services like uh, pro its protective uh, function. So if you have all those factors, I think we haven't yet, uh, we do not have a policy yet on the criteria, but we have the we are doing it right now. For example, uh, if we wanted our watershed to be managed on a sustainable manner, in the integrated watershed management plan, first of all, we do characterization. We characterize the watershed from the, for example, the biological, the physical, and the socioeconomic. And now we have also included the vulnerability assessment. For example, if the watershed is sustainable to flooding, it is sustainable. It is prone to uh, prone to deforestation or biodiversity loss, then you have to address those problems. And then by addressing them in a sustainable manner and in, uh, in an integrated manner, then and then if, if those interventions were implemented effectively, then we could say that that those are the conditions needed for that watershed to be able to sustainably supply all the services that it is rendering to the public and to all the stakeholders within the watershed. But right now, I want to point out that we have not yet uh, uh, made any policy on the criteria, but we are already uh, uh, implementing it in, the, in our policies like the, in the preparation of the integrated watershed management plan. Thank you. Yeah, can I can I add to what Anna Ali said? I, I think you know I, I think it's a very good question, really. You know, um, uh, developing some sort of a health card for watershed, you know, is going to be very useful to guide us in uh, prioritizing our watershed, and at the same time also to guide us in in uh, well, you know what to focus on when we try to develop a, a watershed management plan. I think it's something, Alice. You know that um, that uh, we can do together. We you should, know, we can. We should, yeah, we should. We should develop we could, that. We could drop a policy, sir, on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, uh, it was actually part of our program. If um, uh, if uh, if uh, some of you have uh, heard about the Modisera program, the Modisera program, one of our um, targeted uh, output of that that did not materialize because. Uh, the project, the program was terminated for some technical reasons. Um, uh, is the development of watershed health card, you know, and that is still within the priority list of my to do, no? Nasa to do list ko parin yan, and uh, you know, if uh, if uh, Alice and you know, if Alice, if the FMB, you know, and uh, CFNR can uh, work on this together. Yes, sir, sir, we will be drafting a on that and thank you for that question that is a very significant question thank you very much okay thank you Paul, for your answers um this question next question is directed at dr rex this is from arlene innocential so she asks 
Can you cite specific cases of successes in watershed management? What critical factors contributed to this success? Can we say that NPC, which is managing critical watersheds for hydropower, is successful in Sandy? Mm. Yeah. Uh, hi, Arlene. Um, uh, I, I think you mentioned, you know, a good a good one to point out, you know, and uh, the and these are pertaining to the watersheds under the jurisdiction of. Uh, of uh, National Power Corporation and even the watersheds being managed by Energy Development Corporation, you know, and uh, um, but there are also, you know, there are also watersheds that were uh, that are being uh, managed uh, by uh, by uh, local government units that are uh, uh, doing or achieving certain degree of success, and uh, also some watersheds being. Uh, managed by uh, by uh, DNR itself, but the common you know the, what is common among this uh, properly managed watershed is uh, one you know that uh, there is a committed investment you know there is a committed investment to the uh, to the implementation of uh, of uh, necessary interventions you know to address the uh, issues and concerns with within the watershed and we see that for instance for. Uh, for um, uh, the case of uh, watersheds being managed by EDC and uh, and uh, and uh, NPC, you know NPC and even by uh, uh, local government, some government uh, local government units, and um, um, uh, committed you know committed uh, committed investments. In other words, uh, resources that are committed, you know, for carrying out the watershed uh, management uh, management activities. And uh, in this in these watersheds also, you know, uh, we need to point out that uh, success success, you know, have been achieved uh, where where local communities have been uh, heavily involved or heavily engaged, you know, in uh, different projects in watershed management. And uh, uh, again, you know, we can we can see. This in, we can see this in uh, in uh, watersheds being managed by EDC and, NPC. and uh, even uh, in watersheds that are uh, managed by uh, by LGUs. I can't think of any watershed being managed by LGUs, but uh, I, I you know I can only think of uh, 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 the watershed being managed by uh, by uh, the province of. Uh, Nueva Vizcaya or Bayumbong in specifically, you know, but even this watershed, I know has some challenges, but, uh, you know, given the pressures of uh, population and human activities in this watershed, still I would consider, you know, uh, some degree of success being achieved. And that is, uh, that is because of the, uh, again, you know, that is because of the support of the local government units to it and its partnership with the with the DNR, so you know, I, I think uh, you know if we if we uh, if we look at uh, 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 some factors of success, um, those are you know what I can consider to be what uh, we have observed so far, you know, for those that have been uh, more or less successfully uh, managed. And thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, this um, next question is from Ninda Mora Sulaiman. But there, she did not specify who, which speaker would she like to um, to ask. So any one of you can can answer. Po. she said, "Hi, po. I'm a forester. I am forester Mindamora Sulaiman of Senro Marawi. Tanong po lang po na ang Lanao Sur ay proclaimed watershed reserve by PP 8871. But sa Inay Pass, ay within three years must be legislated to Congress and must be established." Ngayon po, hindi ito na-legislate sa Congress. Ibig sabihin ba ay hindi na-protect area ang Lanao Sur because of the Inay Pass rules? So that's her question. Alice, ikaw na yan. <laughs> Pag mahirap sa'yo. <laughs> Mas mahirap yun sa'yo. Actually, uh, we have a law, the Inay Pass law, and... Uh, under the law, there are 10 steps to be considered in the proclamation of an area or a watershed. In this case, uh, 
a proclaimed watershed reservation as a protected area because uh, we know that uh, all proclaimed watershed reservations are initial component of NIPAS and they should be they should pass the protected area suitability assessment before they could be proclaimed as a uh, protected area. In that case, uh, I just do not know. It hasn't been approved yet by the Congress, but it is at the Congress. So if it is at the Congress, then uh, that means that uh, we are just waiting it for it to be proclaimed as protected area. But in case uh, there was a protected area suitability assessment conducted, and they found out that that watershed or watershed reservation is not suitable to be proclaimed as protected area, then it should be reverted back to its uh, proclamation back then as a proclaimed watershed reservation. But, it, but if under the protected area suitability assessment, it was evaluated and assessed that it is suitable as a protected area and it has been uh, uh, submitted to Congress, then that means that that area should be proclaimed as protected area. We are just awaiting for the Congress to approve it. So in, in that case, unless it was found out that it is not suitable as a protected area. So it should be reverted back to its uh, previous proclamation as proclaimed watershed reservation. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Kulam, for that answer. And now, uh, and now someone would like to give information. Sabi po ni Amisol Talanya. For information lang po, we have a draft policy on the creation of Watershed Management Council for PTWG deliberation na po siya this September. Mm. This is for Sir Anton B. Talanya of the NR Policy Studies Division. Yes. Uh, I just want to clarify. It, the, there is a drop on the creation of Watershed Management Council, but unfortunately, until now, it hasn't been approved yet. So until now, we do not have a, a policy yet on the proclamation, <laughs> I mean, on the creation of Watershed Management Council, but we already had have a draft and it is now at the uh, policy review committee of the DNR. But in, I mean, I mean, if we really wanted to know what policy do we have like, DAO number something or DAO two, DAO three. We still do not have a, a a concrete policy on that, but we have a draft policy already that has not yet been approved. Thank you very much for that uh, clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Next question is from an anonymous attendee, so this can be answered for both speakers. They specified. When we were crafting the information gaps on water resources for the whole Philippines, as funded by the IAEA and NWRB years ago, we learned that in other countries, replenishment, recharge rates, stream discharges, dates of water entry into a water body, water harvest, etc., are monitored. That's why they can do proper water budgeting. Their databases are only re are on real time. With more than 60 government agencies dealing on water resources, are we here in the Philippines doing this now in our 2224 watersheds, 2224 watersheds? That's the question. I don't think so. Yes. <laughs> uh, hindi, hindi. Uh, no, no, no. It's 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 not, you know, it's not uh it's not I'm I'm not aware of any watershed that is actually being you know being monitored real time uh, comprehensively as what uh, has been described um, obviously it will cost a lot of money you know and um, uh, if you know if there is a uh, strong justification for doing it like uh, for instance you know that uh, 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 water supply is uh, imminently in danger of being uh, being uh, impaired, you know, and uh, endangering, for instance, um, thousands and thousands of uh, water users, then that's probably something that can 
push us to do that, you know, if that will help us really to improve the way we allocate water resources. Obviously, yes, um, water allocation, water resources allocation will benefit from, uh, will benefit from real time, uh, real time information or data sets, you know, especially, um, you know, uh, giving us real time data on or information on how much water is coming in and how much water is being uh, released, you know, to be used for different purposes. I mean, uh, those are, you know, those are uh, information that will really make the task uh, a lot easier, but uh, we don't have them yet uh, here in the Philippines, you know, not as comprehensive as that. There are some measurements, but not uh, as comprehensive as what was described. Yes. And right now, uh... Based on our project with Dr. Cruz, the science-based real-time watershed monitoring instruments, the instruments that are only providing real-time data are the automated weather station, automated water le level station, and the CTD groundwater sensor. And we are we wanted to have those real-time data in order to monitor the hydrological condition of our, our watersheds. And it would also help the local government units in terms of their disaster risk management. But right now, those real-time watershed monitoring instruments are very costly. And they also are very costly in terms of maintenance and protection. So right now, the most important, uh, I think the most basic that we wanted to know is uh, are our watersheds uh, prone to flooding, prone to, and can yeah. they be used in terms of uh, mitigating the problems in the watershed? For example, the automated weather station, they also uh, give data on the direction of the wind. So if the direction of, of the wind is in this direction, it would, help the, it would help in the protection activities in terms of the establishment of the, uh, the fire lines, yung mga fire lines ba? Kasi yung direction ng wind, dun, dun pupunta yung fire, so masusunog doon. So dun sila magagawa ng ano, mga fire lines. So those data that we could obtain from those real-time monitoring instruments that we have right now could be, could be used in terms of the interventions that we would be establishing in our watersheds. So yun yun yung muna, yun muna basic. So yung kasi masyado na yung ano, complicated, masyado na siyang mas, mahal, unless meron tayong private companies na meron silang water na gusto nila talaga magsusupply sila, gusto nilang malaman talaga yung detalye at gusto nilang malaman talaga yung real time kasi gusto nila merong ano kasi sila may income sila eh so meron silang ano, pwede silang mag-invest on that. Pero tayo sa government, siguro more on protection, conservation and development muna ng ating watersheds. Thank you. Thank you for that question po. Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you po. And now this next question, uh, this is from Reynante Bacalanco. Uh, his question is, is there any list of species of plants or trees that greatly help in the conservation of our watershed? Mm. Um, <laughs> ang, ang, rule, ang, ang rule of thumb dyan lagi is, you know, you know, what native species you find in a watershed or in a given area you know, is the best species you know that you can uh, that you can have in that uh, particular area so you know that holds true for uh, for any forest area you know if you ask what is the best you know what is the best species to use to restore this forest area and the best answer is always what what are what are or what were the native species that uh, used to be there in that area you know and that should be the best species that uh, we can use to restore back that forest the same is true for watersheds you know if a watersheds to if watersheds to begin with you know have uh, have uh, an inventory of different species that those are the species that should be there you know uh, both from the point of view of hydrology and uh, from the point of view of uh, ecology you know biodiversity and so on so i agree i agree with dr cruz yung kung ano yung nakatanim doon native species that is the best species na dapat itanim doon Pero kasi ngayon, ano eh, parang isang species lang tinatanim. So dapat kasi meron din yung, ano eh, yung, yung concept natin, yung variety. Yung, hindi siya isang species lang. And then right now, personal opinion ko lang, ano, kasi ngayon ang priority yung bamboo. Tapos yun ay tatanim natin. 
So yung sinasabi nga natin, native ba yun doon? Yung appropriate ba siya sa lahat ng area na itanim natin? Although yung bamboo talaga, appropriate at bubuhay sa lahat ng area. Pero kung yun lang itatanim natin sa lahat ng watersheds natin, our watersheds might be prone to pests and diseases. And then we, we would incur pa problems pa kesa dun sa ano, yung ma- masolve natin yung current problems and issues natin. Pero personal opinion, opinion ko lang yun. Kasi yung bamboo kasi nakaka-generate siya ng livelihood and in- income for our ano yung sa ating watershed stakeholders and partners. Thank you. Let me just add ano kasi baka ma-misinterpret yung sinabi ko, you know. I might be misinterpreted, you know, as someone who uh, who uh, how do you call that, you know, how, um, as someone who who does not subscribe to the use of exotic species when needed or um, Uh, species coming from other areas, not necessarily ex- exotic, you know, uh, because there are areas that we must recognize, you know, that uh, we cannot right away uh, restore them back, you know, with the native uh, species there, but uh, we'll have to be uh, conditioned first, you know, conditioned first before they become uh, uh, suitable, you know, for restoration using the original species in the area. So in in uh, there will be cases where uh, you know, foreign species, not necessarily foreign from other countries, but from other parts of the country, you know, will need it, will be, you know, will be more suitable to begin with to start the restoration process. So, uh, yun lang. And, uh, well, we have to recognize also that uh, different species of uh, trees, you know, will have the different, uh, um, will have different consumptive use, you know, when it comes to water, okay? They demand water, uh, Uh, differently, and hence uh, we have to pay particular attention to those species that uses up a lot of water compared to other species, you know, and there are those that uh, we know of. And again, the rule of thumb for determining whether a particular species will use a lot of water or not is uh, by, um, you know, by uh, gauging it on the rate of growth of the species. Usually fast growing species would uh, use up a lot of water. And that is, you know, that is uh, expected because uh, they need to produce more food within a very short period of time, and hence uh, they need more water to produce that. And uh, you know, they use us, uh, they use a lot of water in that sense. So, yeah. So, well, lang and I, sorry, uh, we, we, I don't have any direct answer to that question. Uh, we have very limited studies as to the Uh, as to the uh, amount of water being consumed by different species, you know, except to generally say that uh, uh, some studies have shown that fast-growing species uses up a lot more water than slow-growing trees. Okay, sir. Thank you, Paul, for your answers. And now let's move on to another question. This is from Eloida Esclanda Arenas. She's a DNR Senro. She's from DNR Senro Kalawag, Peson Province. And her question is, Meron po kaming target next year, 2022, for PASA na under po ng initial components of ENI Pass. Ang tanong ko po ay, if ever po na hindi ito pumasa sa PASA, mananatili po ba yung effect noong... Nawala si ma'am. Angelina, Angelina. Uh, wala si Ma'am Michiko. Okay, pasensya na po at na Angelina ata si Michiko. <laughs> Ayun, oh, okay. sorry, I'm here. <laughs> okay, so you're back, Mitch? Yeah, I'm back. Okay. Um, the question from DNR Senro Kalawag. I'll just repeat. <laughs> so sorry. Ayan. So I will repeat the question. Sabi niya po ay meron po kaming target next year 2022 for PASA na under po ng initial components of ENI Pass. Ang tanong ko po ay if ever po na hindi ito pumasa sa PASA, mananatili po ba yung effect noong existing presidential proclamation niya? Thank you. So that's the question. Anyone can answer. Okay ba sir? Yeah, no. Oh, yeah, it will. It will. Yes. Oh. I may, 
may, baka merong sagot si Sir muna bago ako. No, ako ang tingin ko, yes, the proclamation will remain. No? I'm not uh, I'm not sure whether the proclamation of uh, the president expires, you know, at some uh, at some point, but I'm not aware of that. So, if there is no expiration, that means that uh, it will revert back to the status as proclaimed by the uh, by the president. Um, actually, kapag ka hindi siya po masasapasa, uh, meaning uh, it is not suitable po as a protected area, mamaintain siya as, yung kumbaga, kung, kung siya ay watershed reservation, mamaintain siya as watershed reservation. Pero minsan kasi, katulad ng isang sa region 4A, yung buong ano, uh, proclaimed watershed reservation, nagkaroon ng suitability assessment, nagkaroon na inventory, and then meron lang portion doon na suitable for protected area. For protected area. Merong hindi suitable. So yung area lang na yon, yun ang sinubmit as a uh, sa SPA. So ano mayayari doon sa ano? Doon sa wala, wala magma-manage no kasi akala ng DNR yung being ano siya, being initial component ng NIPAS. Pasok na kaagad siya doon sa ano, BMB. Ang sabi namin dapat iano uli siya, i-delineate uli siya, yung hindi po masasapi sa sa pasa, balik siya, revert siya, ang magmamanage pa rin siya kanya, at saka ang meron pa rin jurisdiction, jurisdiction sa kanya, yung sa forest sector, hindi yung sa BMB. So yun yun, so kung ang buong naman, ano, buong proclamation, hindi siya po masasa pasa, revert, revert siya, talagang mamaintain pa rin yung, eh, yung, ano niya yung kanyang yung kanya pagiging ano uh, proclaimed watershed reservation. So yun yung ruling niya. Kung hindi siya pumasa ng pasa o portion lang yung pumasa, yun lang yung magiging PA. Yung matitira o kung yung buo hindi pumasa ng pasa, ano pa rin siya maintain pa rin yung kanya ano proclamation as watershed reservation. So meron na po nangyaring ganon. Thank you po, ma'am. Thank you po. Thank you po for your answer. And now, because of the lack of time, we are nearing the end of our open forum. It's already 4.19 p.m. But I will just ask one more question, and then I will let you, Ma'am Castillo and, and Sir Cruz, to give a few words, um, last words for, for this webinar. Although um, we this is a watershed series, so we will be expecting more from you naman po. But uh, first, before the last, last comments, this is another question. The last question from Dante Aquino. This is a question for, oh, this is for Forrester Castillo. Po. So is, their question is, is there a legal basis in the creation of watershed management councils? Who is responsible of organizing these councils? At what level should councils be organized? Micro, small, large, river basin level? What is the role of LGUs with jurisdiction within specific watersheds? Mm -hmm. So, Mama Castillo. Uh, right now, right now, the creation of watershed management councils, ano lang siya, parang voluntary. Kung baga siya, demand-driven siya. Kung gusto nung isang, kung gusto nung stakeholder, holders doon sa isang watershed, mag-create ng watershed management council, nag-create sila. Katulad noon sa Mindanao, Yung sa Lake Lanao, yung sa Lake Lanao kasi nagka-problema sila doon sa in terms of the, yung sa ano nila, yung sa power. Nagkaroon sila ng power. So ang sabi nila, the, the whole Lake Lanao watershed, so they created the Watershed Management Council and all the stakeholders were were became part of the members of the Watershed Management Council. So ganun ngayon. So ngayon parang ganun. Kasi nga, wala pa tayong law. We, do, we still do not have a law on the creation of Watershed Management Council. Like in PD 705, hindi nakalagay doon. Yung creation of Watershed Management Council is not uh, is not included doon sa provisions of PD 705. Under the NIPAS law, PAMBI ang nandun. Under, uh, although pinaperson namin noon na makasama siya doon sa water code, yung sa create pero para hindi rin siya pumasa eh. So ngayon, ang inaano na namin, ang pinapersonal na namin, yung DAO, yung Department Administrative Order on the Creation of Watershed Management Council. And then the creation of the Watershed Management Council, ang member siya should be the regional director. And then kung meron doong NPC, ano siya, uh, 
ako, co-chairman siya. And then kung meron doong uh, local government units, kung meron doong apat na probinsya halimbawa yon yung nag-occupy ng pinakamalaking area, yun yung co-chairman. And then all the other, all the rest ng ano, local government units kasama doon and also the NGOs, basta lahat ng stakeholders. And then yung level niya, kasi nga rich to rich siya eh. So meron tayong region, meron tayong provincial, and then meron tayong community. So meron siyang sub-council. Tapos ang pinaka nag-aano sa kanya, nagpukumpas sa kanya, yung talagang Watershed Management Council ng rich to rich. Pero meron siyang, uh, meron siyang community then meron siyang uh, provincial, and then merong regional siya. Pero, kumbaga, lahat sila, isang watershed lang yung minamanage niya. Pero sa ngayon, concept pa lang siya, yung drop niya, nandun pa lang sa PTWG ng DNR. And then yung roles and responsibilities niya, coordinative at saka yung overseer. Kumbaga, ino-oversee niya na yung integrated watershed management plan, lahat na activities doon, lahat, lahat ng roles ng agencies involved, lahat ng stakeholders, gagawin nila tapos lahat ng naka-indicate nung sa watershed management plans na para para ma-address yung lahat ng issues and problems titingnan niya kung pinopondohan tapos kung meron doon gan chart itong year na ito ito ang dapat gawin yun yung titingnan ng council and then kung meron doon mga issues like yung conflicting issues and ba gusto ng isang stakeholders gawing mining yung area yung isang portion ng watershed yung isa naman hindi pwede kasi source of water supply niya yung Watershed Management Council, yun ang magdi-decide. So yun yung, yun yung maganda pag may Watershed Management Council. Kasi pag walang Watershed Management Council, kanya-kanya. So hindi, kumbaga, hindi na-address yung problems natin in an integrated manner. Kasi katulad nga nung sa Chico Watershed, ang problema yung sa taas. Kahit anong gawin ng LGU sa baba, yung kalinga, kahit anong pera yung bu- ibuhos niya dun sa baba, hindi niya na-address yung problem niya on siltation kasi ang source niya nandun sa taas. So dapat makipag-usap siya doon sa taas para hindi para hindi maging silted yung kanyang river sa baba. So dapat meron doon council na i-address yung problem na yun then mag-uusap yung darong LGs. Parang yung, yun yung kagandahan ng Watershed Management Council na gusto natin magkaroon ngayon ng isang policy talaga na basis para lahat ng watershed natin magkakaroon ng watershed management council. So yun yung yung importance talaga ng ano nung law at saka ng policy on watershed management council on the creation of watershed management council. Thank you. Thank you ma'am for very comprehensive answer. And now um this will be the last um portion of our open forum. I'm really sorry for the participants who contributed questions but we would try to address that later. I mean um Um, outside this webinar na lang po. Um, but um, may we allow our speakers to give very brief um, last message for this webinar. Um, um, Sir Rex, um, uh, you can start. Uh, your last message for the participants today. Sir, you may kindly unmute po yourself. Okay, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, I think your interest in this uh, in this topic on watershed is um, is uh, critical to the advancement of uh, the advocacy of DNR, save uh, our watershed, and even the uh, initiatives of uh, of the watershed uh, section headed by uh, Forester Alice Castillo. Um, this uh, saving our watershed and uh, uh, keeping our watershed sustainable. You know, is a business of uh, is a business of everyone, as we always say, of many of our natural resources, and uh, hence, you know, the more you know, and the more people know about watershed, then uh, uh, the better chances that we have to succeed in uh, our projects, you know, in our initiatives, in uh, protecting our uh, watershed. So uh, just keep, you know, just keep what you're doing, keep interested, and keep uh, learning. Uh, there will be a next series to uh, to this um, to this um, webinar, you know, and uh, I hope that uh, we see you again uh, next time. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Director uh, Resi, and uh, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now, uh, Forrester Castillo, um, just a brief message, please, for our participants. Uh, 
For our participants, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. And thank you very much for all your questions. And uh, you have been very active in, uh, in this webinar in terms of questioning and in terms of uh, your interest. Actually, ano eh, yung sabi natin ang watershed hindi lang sa DNR eh, katulad noong sa water. Kapag ka hindi tayo naging active, tayo ang magkakaproblema. Either yung ating drinking water magkocontaminate or magkakaroon tayo ng landslide o magkakaroon tayo ng flooding. So yung DNR, magpo-provide lang siya ng policies, assistance, technical assistance, and other technical assistance needed in the management, conservation, and development of the watershed. But in terms of the implementation and in terms of the... Protection of our watershed, that is the role of everybody, the DNR, uh, all of the stakeholders within a watershed, and the public as well. We should all be active in terms of, the manage, in terms of managing our, our watersheds because if we will not be managing effectively our watersheds, tayo rin yung mahihirapan, tayo rin yung maapektuhan. So, so ito yung simula. Sana ito yung simula na lahat tayo maging active in terms of the watershed management. Saka yata ako nawala din. Saka yung organizers din pala at saka doon sa ano, kay Dr. Cruz, kay, ano, kay Director Mars Amaro, kay ASEC Mars Amaro, kay, kay Director Dolom, sa organizers, sa FMP, at saka sa FDC, sa UP, Diliman, at saka sa lahat organizers. Thank you very much for ano for ikumbaga hosting this activity or event very ano to very timely at saka very ano talaga siya very kumbaga itong event na ito napaka ano niya napaka relevant niya lalo na ngayong ano ngayon nakikita natin maraming landslide maraming flooding katulad nitong bagyong Julina nakita natin marami na namang landslide maraming flooding so isa isa tayo para para tayo ay ano ma-manage natin yung watershed. Sabi nga natin, pag minanage natin yung watersheds natin, makaka-save tayo ng maraming lives. Thank you very much. Yun lang po. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our resource speakers. Let us give them a virtual round of applause. <laughs> And we will proceed to the awarding of certificates to our speakers. I will read the citation. Po. So please continue um, for Sir Castillo and Dr. Cruz. Please continue to uh, open your cameras. Later on, we will have a uh, photo op with the certificates. Ayan. So I will just read the citation. The certificate of appreciation is awarded to Dr. Victor, Dr. Rex Victor O. Cruz and Forrester Alicia L. Castillo for serving as speakers in the policy forum, Watershed Key Features, Functions, and Current Status of the Watersheds in the Philippines, held this 8th of September 2021, organized by the Forestry Development Center through the UPLB Foundation, Inc. Incorporated, and in partnership with the Forest Management Bureau for the implementation of the Save Our Watershed campaign. With the support from Information Technology Center, UPLB, via Zoom webinar. Given this 8th day of September 2021, signed ASEC Marshall C. Amaro Jr., Dean Marlo D. Mendoza, and Director Priscilla C. DeLong. Ayan. So let us uh, give them a virtual uh, clap. <laughs> Ayan. Um, so before we move on to the next segment, may I invite Dr. Dolom, Asek Amaro to also open their cameras. Dean Mendoza, if you are still here, to open their cameras and join us in this photo documentation. May I also request the speakers to still hold on to their certificates as we take a picture, if you have it na po. Um, Ma'am Castillo, do you have it na po, uh, the certificate? <laughs> Maybe, it's <being laughs> <delivered. po>. Virtual. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's being delivered pa po. Okay, that's all right. Thank you very much po. Um, we will just have a quick um, photo doc. Ayan, so I'm just pinning Ma'am Pre here. All right. So let's just take a picture. I'll just count from one to three po, okay? One, two, three, smile. 
Ayan. Thank you so much. Um, I have got the I got the picture na po. May, we, we may uh, we may turn off our our uh, cameras now. Ayan. Now to deliver the closing remarks, may I call on the director of FDC, Dr. Priscilla C. Dolong. Thank you, Michiko. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today's Power Arts Policy E-Talks Watershed Management Series is a sequel of the five policy fora on the Save Our Watershed campaign of the Forest Management Bureau, DNR. If you remember, the first forum was held last August 4 with the team Valuation of Watershed Ecosystem Services for Policy, the Philippine Emulation Cases. And since today's forum is the second of the five Paris Fora, we agreed to have the team Watershed, the features, functions, and current status of watershed in the Philippines. This is in order for us to understand more our watershed in terms of its features, functions, and current status, as well as the pressing issues and concerns and programs implemented to address these issues. Our speakers for today, we have Dr. Rex Victor of Cruz and Forrester Aris Castillo are both watershed experts and advocates. We thank them for giving us detailed and comprehensive discussions about our watershed, its importance, our functions, and for tackling some important issues, concerns, problems, and challenges on our watershed management. Dr. Rex Victor Orpus discussed the, cla the classifications of our watershed based on their areas or sizes, may small, medium, and large. According to him, the smaller the watershed, the more sensitive it is in terms of climate, human activities, and others. And we must be careful of our activities. River Basin is, poor, is the largest watershed and which is more than 100,000 hectares. He presented to us the status of the existing river basins in the country. According to him, 90% of the total area of the Philippines are watersheds, which is important for water supply. He also added that watershed is a landscape unit made up of interconnected ecosystems, interconnected ecosystem services, and with interconnected problems and issues. He said the major problems in our watersheds are forest cover loss and land use conversion. He is advocating for the preparation of integrated watershed management plan. On the other hand, Forester Aris Castillo shared with us the status of our Philippine watersheds, the integrated watershed management planning, which is from the reeds to reef approach, the DNR programs concerning watershed management. And some of these programs are the National Greening Program, the Enhanced and Expanded National Greening Program, or NGP, Forest Protection, Small Water Impounding System, the Small Water Impounding Project, and the Science-Based Real-Time Watershed Monitoring Instrumentation. She also identified the DNR's five three priority issues and concerns in watershed management, as well as the current initiatives being done the gaps and recommendations. Today's discussions has provided us an avenue for sharing our experiences, ideas, and knowledge on our watershed. The, the discussions may, may, may not still be enough, but we expect that this clarified some issues and problems and provided a clearer understanding of the state of our Philippine watershed. We hope that today will just be one of the many more opportunities where we can show and even amplify our commitment to save our watershed. At what, as what ASEC Amaro Jr. said, saving watersheds is saving life. Before I close, may I take this opportunity to thank our Dean, Professor Marlo Mendoza, uh, ASEC Marshall Amaro Jr and our two main speakers, Dr. Rex Victor Ocus, a retired professor, academician, and a former FDC director, and Forrester Alice Castillo of FMD DNR, Forrest Judith Castillo and Michiko Bruot, our MC moderators. 
I would like also to thank, of course, our participants, which totaled to almost 862 via Zoom and 181 in Epic Live, in spite of Tropical Storm Jolina. From the participants from the academe, comprised of schools, colleges, and universities, uh, the PIPEN members, students, the FMB and DNR officials and staff, and other non-governmental agencies, people's organizations, non-governmental organizations or the civil society organizations, the private sector or agencies, the Society of Filipino Foresters Incorporated, the local government units, our colleagues from UPLB, particularly the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, and participants from other, other countries for taking the time to attend this forum. Lastly, let me express our gratitude to our partner, the Forest Land Management Project of FMB DNR, the UPLB Information Technology Center, and of course, the Policy Development Center staff for their hard work, commitment, and support to sustain our forest policy ethos. Again, on behalf of the Policy Development Center, maraming salamat po and mabuhay.